Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, you're at the Charlotte's web chat in case you're not sure about that. And we're really excited today um, with our guests. And I think that they probably are the reason why you're here is to hear from the Stanley brothers and Heather Jackson themselves. I'm just so excited to be able to talk with these, what I would call radical pioneers who started the CBD industry because these are the people who gave hope to so many families who were truly searching for answers. And um, I'm happy to have um, Joel and Jesse here uh, to talk about how the company got started and Heather Jackson will be talking about um, the realm of caring and her personal story. So uh, can we start off with you, Jesse Stanley? Can you just say hi to everyone and just tell us a little something about yourself? Hello, everybody. Um, I am Jesse. I am uh, the fourth in the line of 11 children of the Stanley family, the third boy, um, co-founder of Charlotte's Web, uh, CEO of Stanley Brothers, which is uh, a new company that we recently rolled out that has a line of uh, cannabis products in the uh, medical and retail marijuana space called Recreate. So I've been pretty busy with that, um, but um, still involved in the Charlotte's website um, as a as a speaker and uh, pr promoting that brand. So uh, it's our baby, and uh, uh, love to talk about the history, and I'm excited about today. Yeah, you can never escape us, Jesse. No matter what you try, you'll always be part of this. <laughs> we'll always bring you back in. And Joel, do you want to introduce yourself as well and tell us about what you're doing? Sure. I'm Joel Stanley, Jesse's older brother by just a little over a year. Um, I, I was the first CEO of Charlotte's Web and remained that for, um, for over five years. And now I still sit on the board. I'm the chairman of the board at Charlotte's Web. I spend a lot of my time still um, helping the management team and giving my input from my experience over, over the years um, to the Charlotte's Web team. So I'm I'm still quite involved um, with with Charlotte's Web today. Great. And Heather Jackson, can you please say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, for having me. I'm Heather Jackson. I'm the co-founder and board president of Realm of Caring, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that supports cannabinoid research and education. I also founded Unlimited Sciences, which is a psychedelic nonprofit, uh, and then uh, just other various nonprofit activities is what I'm up to right now. I'm enjoying spending time with Zakai as he's transitioning into adulthood. I'm, I'm just spending a ton of time with him right now, and that's been just a great joy and really thankful to be on with my, with my friends and to talk about the history. It's my favorite story. We're so glad you were able to join us. And I just love hearing this story. So let's jump in and start with the brothers. So you guys started this uh, almost a decade ago or a little over a decade ago. Um, you and several of your brothers were working in the oil industry and working other types of jobs, um, completely unrelated to the medicine or cannabis or hemp. Um, and so at some point, something happened and you all decided like, let's get involved with farming and start uh, working with hemp and CBD and cannabis products. So what happened that made you change your mind from just changing course so drastically and that you all decided to do that? Um, I'll answer that. Uh, one, one was necessity. Uh, 2008 was the, the recession that kind of hit and you saw a, a lot of us were in the oil and gas industry, whether that's um, as guys on the working on the rigs or uh, Joel was doing more engineering work um, and the, that really tanked. And so jobs kind of were lost there and, and production and people came back uh, to Colorado. Some of us were in Texas and, and Joel kind of still stayed in Texas for a little bit, but um, that was one aspect of it. And then Joel and my older brother, Josh, uh, Josh had the first really dispensary in Colorado called the Peace and Medicine Center. Um, and he invited us up and started talking to us about uh, cultivating for him and being a, a supplier. Uh, Joel really spearheaded the, the research on that and understanding what it was because until 
until that time, cannabis to me I had, it was the devil's lettuce. Um, I smoked it a couple times. I wasn't. It wasn't like my my thing. Um, I wasn't against it by any means. It just wasn't my thing. Um, and I certainly didn't really understand the value of medicinal cannabis and what it could do for for people and certain ailments. Joel really discovered that through his own research, and he talk about that in a bit. And uh, he got us over the the edge, really, um, to with the research that he did, and he can talk about that too basically put all of our eggs into this basket um, and then kind of what unfolded it took a, a, a long period of time, what felt like ages. Um, but yeah, Joel can probably talk a little bit about the research and, and why uh, he felt inclined to do the research. Yeah, sure. what you got you involved, Joel? Yeah, so um, like Jesse said, I was living in Texas. I was working in the oil field and actually I'm um, I was I was one of the jobs that was still remaining um, as as there was a recession. I was able to keep mine for quite a while, and um, I actually flew back to Colorado to hang out with my brothers and go to a John Prine concert. God rest his soul; he just passed recently. Um, but we're all big fans of him, and <clears throat> it was my first time to be back in Colorado in a in a few years, and really my first day off in a long time. I flew back to go to that concert, and of course, I had to go and see my older brother's dispensary. He started one of the first dispensaries in the city of Denver, I think the first dispensary, but um, I, I had to go see it. And as I walked through those doors, and I have to tell you, I was expecting for this to be just an excuse to get high. I didn't think cannabis was medical. I wasn't a prohibitionist but I didn't believe in it at all. I, it, it was kind of a joke to me, but I, but I walked into this dispensary and as luck would have it, the three people that would walk in after me um, would be people dealing with various um, cancer types and going through different cancer treatments and a couple of them quite stereotypical, you know, losing hair from chemotherapy treatment. And I was able to get their stories <clears throat> and I was blown away by what cannabis was able to do for them. And as someone who experimented with it when I was young and it really wasn't for me either, um, I, I had never understood that this phenomenon that everyone calls the munchies, this, this appetite stimulation could actually save a life. And when you're dealing with some of those intense cancer treatments, um, oftentimes you can't eat and you can't sleep. And if you can't eat, you're not going to sustain your body long enough to go through those, those very toxic treatments. Um, and so some of these folks, all three of these folks had a viable story that, that sleep and appetite stimulation had saved their life through these treatments. And I believed them. That was fascinating to me. I flew back actually the next day. We went to the concert. We hung out. We actually watched the sunrise that that happens less and less these days, but um, we stayed up talking all, all night and I was just on cloud nine. I, I flew back to my job in Texas and I had to go and look and jump on my computer, jump on the internet to see um, what medical cannabis really meant. And back then there were between 19 and 20,000 um, published papers. Now, granted, most of them, most of the research was being done here in the U.S. on any negative impacts of cannabis use because of our, our prohibition. Um, but there were a lot of papers, quite a few papers, showing the positive impacts, and you were seeing words like anti-inflammatory, anti-tumoral, anti-cancer, anti-spasmodic, um, neuroprotectant, um, antioxidant. We were... It, it, that was peppered throughout the more positive literature. And much of that came out of Israel and other places of the world. And it blew my mind. I said, okay, I met these people. This, this can really help people. But there's also all of this research that shows we need to be studying this. Right about the same time, the Obama administration had released a memorandum. This is 2008 that said, all right, federal government's going to leave, leave, medical marijuana patients alone that are compliant with their state. Now, of course, they didn't for some time. You know, there were still lots of DEA raids after that. But um, everything signaled to me that we had an opportunity to get into something that would be meaningful in people's lives, 
um, and that was cutting edge of research that we had forgotten about as a species and we had prohibited for so long. Um, and I just got so excited. And as I talked to the younger brothers, um, that excitement spread to them. Um, and it, they started, John and Jared started building our very first grow facility while I was still in Texas and Jared was maxing out his credit. And I was, I was sending, sending money back. Um, and then I moved back and Jesse and I, just a couple months after they had started, we started our first grow facility. So we had, we had two and they were very clandestine grow facilities, but um, that was how you had to do it back then. They were but, magic. I don't know what you mean by clandestine. <laughs> <laughs> they were, it was sacred ground for me, I'll tell you that. Absolutely. And, and of course it, it evolved from what our first grows looked like to when Got we, it. I didn't see the first grow. <laughs> I didn't see the basement grow and you avoiding the knock on the door or whatever. I guess. <laughs> Timeline, Stanley Brothers. First experience was the mountain, so yeah. And and we had we'd come a little way since then, and we've come a long way since then. But um, I know. <laughs> Timeline, just for people's reference, the Stanley Brothers jumped in in late 2008. That's how long we've yeah. been researching, studying, growing, um, and product development for for cannabis. Yeah, and in Colorado, you had sort of um, more receptive uh, laws towards that. I mean, it wasn't completely black and white, but you felt comfortable, and Colorado was probably the most open-minded state at that time, right? It was, you know, it was, it was uh, in our constitution slowly for the medical uh, marijuana part of it, but it was still, you know, a gray area because your agencies, your DEA, um, and uh, the police department and stuff like that. There was, cannabis was in their purview. So it was a very large part of their, their, uh, their budget. And they didn't want to lose that. So there was still like this figuring it out with law enforcement and the laws, because just because something was legal didn't mean, and then the flip side of this, and we're still dealing with this today is that cannabis in the industry comes from an illegal underground world. So now you're bringing out all of these quote unquote at the time criminals and people that have been doing this in the black market. So they're trying to operate in a, in a, in a, in a legal place in a whilst regulated in a regulated place while still having their foot in what they knew, which was the black market. So it was a very slow process of learning how this could be done and regulated. And for us, you know, Joel's right. We had basement grows and I remember we had so many scares. I mean, there's a book worth of scares um, and trying to protect the house and, and the smell. And I mean, you know, you're using so much electricity. One story, we were using so much electricity. We we're like, you know, this is a hot spot for Excel. If I'm a cop, I'm looking at this place and I'm like, man, these guys are operating a movie theater. And so, you know, we bought like a used piece of crap hot tub just to act like you know we're using more power because if you were to go by the house you're like i, I hadn't heard that story that's awesome <laughs> what are these guys doing here? and then you know there's times where you'd hear a bang on the door and we would crawl up the stairs from the grow taking care of the plants and crawl over to the window and outside is this this truck and it's black and it looks like an atf truck and i'm like okay well this is this is good. This is how we, where we're going to end up in jail. And then off drives the milkman. So um, we. Yeah, and, and as we know, hemp has a lot of terpenes and it's very, very fragrance. And it's, it's a very, smell that's difficult to hide. <laughs> and we are masters at hiding that smell. If anyone knows. <laughs> we don't have to hide it anymore. But we back, don't have to hide it. Back then, you know, when you were sandwiched in between neighbors and, you know, of course, no one would rent to you yet. You couldn't get commercial space yet. Um, and you were dealing in this, you know, um, gray area of the law. You learned, you learned how to hide that very potent, powerful terpene gassing off smell that, that everyone knows about cannabis and hemp. Yeah, you guys are definitely the renegades. And it's interesting, Joel, it was um, maybe the science that started to get you interested in this. And um, I don't know if people know this, but it was the um, federal government's research on the uh, drugs and addiction division, um, trying to figure out how, how uh, medical marijuana works in the brain. And that's how they discovered the endocannabinoid system. 
by learning how those compounds work in the brain. And now we know a lot about the endocannabinoid system since back then. And, but it was also not just science that uh, persuaded you to get involved, but it was also a personal family story um, of someone that you were trying to help. Um, would you want to tell everyone a little bit about that? Yeah, um, well, I would say that uh, our, our, our first interest, my first heart of hearts for, for cannabis, and it was for years and it's still a part of what we believe, um, was the benefits potentially for cancer, both treating the side effects um, as an adjunct therapy to help people get, get through the side effects of, of some of the existing conventional treatments. But also there's all this research showing that cannabinoids in mice or in, or in Petri dishes also has the ability to potentially treat the underlying disease um, in that it interacts with the cancer cells themselves. And some people know a lot about that. I do encourage people to go and read about that because it's fascinating. We need to do a ton of, a ton of research there and I think it's going to happen over the next decade or two. But um, so cancer was where we were laser focused and we really wanted to find the people we could benefit the most. Um, we weren't interested in just selling weed. Um, so our first medical marijuana patient, and that's what you called him in the state, that we were caregiver for, um, that meant that we got to grow their, their plants and provide their medicine. Um, our first one was our cousin Ron. He's actually our second cousin. We, we called him Uncle Ron because he's, he was older, but um, he, had, um, he had a pancreatic cancer and was really wasting away. And the first cannabis oil we made, which the first product we ever gave to anyone, we gave to him. And it was an oil that he was able to know how many milligrams he was getting of THC. Um, and back then, not a lot of people were, were doing that. It was really rare. You, if you had edibles, you had brownies and maybe a sucker. And the, and the consistency of the, the, the potency was all over the board and maybe not even tested, you know, not tested in the very beginning. Um, and there were very few laboratory options to even test. Um, so, you know, we, we took folks like Ron, this family member, and we helped him significantly. We improved his quality of life um, for several years, you know, beyond what he thought he had. Um, but we, right out of the gate, started developing products in which we could tell and our patients could tell, this is how much I'm getting so that I can re reproduce my experience. And all of our work in formulating those, those THC oils um, I have to say in a divine way prepped us for what we would need to know when we met Charlotte Figgy for the first time, when we met Heather and we're working with her and her son Zakai for the first time. Um, so we kind of had this wild story in which <clears throat> we had upped our game in what we were making and in what we understood about the product before a pediatric situation would end up coming to us in this highly taboo space still. Yeah, you were really focused on um, making it safe for people and making it predictable um, so that it was really could be used medicinally. And everyone should realize this is long before we started the company of Charlotte's Web. This was a different company prior to this. Um, and well, actually, we're it, so at this time you were trying to help people like your uncle you met um, Charlotte, you met Zakai, and your mission continued to be to help people who were in need. But you guys are really generous and you were giving away a lot of your product to people who really needed it. Um, so how was that for you um, when you realized that you just couldn't keep that model up forever and Heather and Paige came to you and just said, guys, you know, we need to become a business here and make this official and um, kind of transition this into, you know, something a little bit more sustainable. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was kind of a, a slow process for us because we started as this company called organics Alliance and uh, that was our first company. And uh, uh, that shifted to Stanley brothers, social enterprises. Uh, 
Um, and so we always had this social entrepreneurial uh, aspect of it, of valuing people over profit. And so our goal was always to give uh, the, the oil away or the products that, were, that we really deemed as medicinal, specifically at the time was cancer patients and, and people with different uh, ailments, um, was to sell pot on the wholesale market for the people that we, to the, dispensary. to the dispensary market for the people that were, you know, smoking it and had stubbed toes and really bad back pain. And then turn around and give the products, use that cash to be able to turn the product into oil that will later be uh, now known as Charlotte's Web. Um, but our goal and what people called us back then were the Robin Hoods of marijuana because we, we were giving it away. We never had the function or, or the idea until Charlotte, because we were growing relatively s slower, I would say. We had probably a bank of maybe 100 to 200 people that were we were giving oil away for free. Um, and most of those cancer patients. Um, and then Charlotte came along and, and Heather and Paige really helped us see what was coming. Um, you know, when Sanjay Gupta did the weed series, it really shot us to the moon. And, and Heather and Paige really helped us build our landing gear. So we had this ship in this vehicle, but no place to land. So we just had to orbit while we, while we figured that out. And Joel uh, really came up with the first price structure, which was a cost of good. And we were selling the CBD per milligram at our cost of good, which was, which was um, still the lowest price in the industry. And, and at the time, the lowest, still one of the lower priced products in the industry for the quality that you get. A lot of people don't understand even today what quality means in this space. Um, and we can get into that in a bit, but we set that structure. And the reason why really we knew it, but Paige and, and Heather were, were like, look, if you guys aren't profitable, you're not going to be able to give this to other people. And the storm is coming for you guys that you don't know. And it did. And, and overnight, really, we had like a 15,000 person waiting list and that kept growing. But because of the medical marijuana program, uh, we had a decision to make because you could only grow so many plants, um, six plants per patient as they called them. So we were limited by our ability to grow and the, the, the product that was making money for us was THC. So we had to sacrifice the THC grow and cut it way back in the expectation that people would come from all over the world, which they did. So we started growing the Charlotte's Web genetics um, in probably a, it used to be like 80 20 and we probably switched it to more 2080 um and it really helped us take people off the wait list but the the end goal was in uh, 2012 i believe whenever the uh colorado government legalized cannabis um for retail purposes now that didn't really 13. 13 so that didn't really have a lot <clears throat> to do with us on a medical marijuana standpoint. But in that bill, it also legalized hemp. And we knew that this plant belonged in hemp because it was lower in THC. It allowed us to scale and not be confined by plant counts. Um, and at that time, you know, we took people off that waiting list, the 15,000 person waiting list, and you had all these medical Colorado refugees with whatever they called them, marijuana refugees, coming to Colorado to get their med card. What this allowed us to do was to, to completely eliminate that, um, that wait list. And people were actually have the option to move back home where they came from to have this product once we decided to start shipping which was another milestone in our company, but it's a beautiful story. It's been documented somewhat, but some of those stories are Heather and, and, and Paige helped organize all of these families that were dependent upon Charlotte's Web to come out and help us hand plant our first crop because we didn't have the money, we didn't have the, the infrastructure to, to cultivate in modern irrigation the way that people uh, do today in the way that we do today. It was very hands-on, hard, hard labor. It still is, but uh, it's, it was really cool to see the families of these, of these uh, children that were coming to Colorado 
actually get their hands dirty and be able to plant the plant that would their their child relied on. So that's a, As a parent. Yeah, I think you would do anything right to get there more quickly. So the the process previously was so difficult because uh, frankly people died on this wait list because you had to relocate, you had to get two doctor signatures. You could ask your doctor for an increased plant count because our kids use a lot of this, um, a lot of milligrams of this, um, but then you'd still have to wait for it to be planted and harvested and, and all of that. And so it was a, it was dark. It was a really dark uh, time. And um, as parents, we just wanted to, you know, Paige and I just really wanted to organize around that and, and help them. And they had something like, 17,000 plants or something to put in the ground by hand <laughs> and we're waiting for oil. so yes we put on our sunscreen and our hats and brought the family and <laughs> I remember my son was 16 years old my older boy uh Zarek and he's tickling the roots Jared taught him how to tickle the roots which is just break up break up the roots and put his brother's medicine in the ground you know what we call you know you all can't call it that this is my son's medicine and so that was not only was it needed for our families it was just this special time in creating community which i think is what this whole thing has been about like if we want to you know we're talking about this plant quite a bit it's just not about that this is this was about creating community and helping helping people like Zakai and Charlotte and thousands and thousands of other other families. So yeah, I mean, talk about hands on. Everybody yeah. chipped in to make this work. And what you are telling us is really the birth of the CBD industry, in my opinion. I mean, this is where it started. You guys figured out it's the CBD, it's the hemp. This is what's helping the kids, and you all forge that path to keep going in that direction. So as a mom, Heather, did you feel like um, at first when you realized that this plant was going to help your son or as you came along to figure that out, were you embracing it immediately or did you have a little hesitation because we were in that gray area and it wasn't quite accepted yet and it yeah. was your child? In the beginning, I, I was definitely um, scared is the really the only word to describe that. I mean, the only thing worse than watching your child seize is not being able to watch them at all because social services involved or, you know, something like that. And I, I was very afraid of that. You know, uh, people don't realize even when Charlotte got her doctor's recommendations, the, the, the state actually didn't issue her medical license. They just like ignored the application. So she had the application with the doctor's signatures and everything. And that's what she was going to use it should in the event something would happen. But, you know, I called Department of Human Services and explained what was going on. And my son um, was receiving hospice palliative services along with Charlotte. And um, you know, it was Miss Kate, our hospice counselor, who said, hey, here's some, here's some phone numbers. And so in my investigation, I was, I was afraid. It's also my son, you know, I, I'm always embarrassed to say this number was on 17 different pharmaceuticals. Wow. The idea with epilepsy, intractable epilepsy, after your third seizure medication, you have less than a 1% chance of finding something that will work. So we were just focused on quality of life. You know, I wasn't expecting his seizures to go away or, you know, anything like that. Now, 17 treatments, that's the only one I like called my mom to talk to her about what I was going to be doing. I cared about what she thought. So just like where my mind was is, yes, byproduct of the 80s. This is your brain on drugs with the egg in the front. And what am I doing here? And my husband totally thought I was nuts. He had no idea. Like she's gone. She's totally lost it, right? She's after almost 10 years of this, your mom lost it. <laughs> but then if, after you look, just like Joel said, at some of the research, you're like, there's, there is a little bit of hope here. And so in the beginning, as yes, I was very afraid, as I think most parents are, I've never, I'm not a, a criminal. I've never done anything against the law. I just try to save my kid. You know, that yeah, and you were a brave pioneer, not only to help your child, though, but you ended up helping a lot of other people. A lot of families came here because they heard the stories, and it was you and, I believe, Paige on yeah. the phone 
talking to people. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? That was really the start of Realm of Caring, uh, which has grown to be much bigger than that now. Yeah, I mean, you have an obligation when you find something that works, no matter what it is. So as much as we, you know, wish it was like dandelion root or something, and not this very stigmatized plant, it was. It was cannabis. That's what it was. And so we had an obligation to tell our community, which is this, you know, the intractable epilepsy community. And we started that in a very kind of secretive way in little private closed Facebook groups. And that's how we were able to tell the brothers that this is coming because there was, again, you just don't have any other options or you're just supposed to let your child continue to seize supposedly. Uh, so we, and then we, other people with other conditions began to be interested. These, you know, people who they've done everything Western medicine said to do. I did everything our neurologist said to do. There was just, this tool wasn't in his tool belt, that's all. And so we felt this extreme obligation to, you know, to talk about it. And then you can only be on the phone having a conversation, you know, well, 24 hours a day, <laughs> minus a few for sleeping, you know, that's sort of, that's kind of it. That's all. You and take care of your kids. So we had to sort of systemize this and that's how Realm of Caring was, was born. We created the 501c3, the nonprofit organization. We systemized how we wanted to educate um, at, mainly at first parents, later doctors uh, have come along, uh, but at first we just wanted parents to know um, that this was an option. And that has now grown to over 60,000 families who are, who are you know, members, if you will, of Realm of Caring, who are receiving this education and, and able to look at data-centric uh, answers to their questions. Uh, and so, yeah, Realm of Caring has been very responsive to the community needs. So we've done financial grants for families to the tune of close to $500,000, given cash directly back to families to offset the cost of a therapy that insurance doesn't cover, uh, and then really furthering the research. Uh, so you have clinical trials, but these aren't, this is not, you know, products that people are using every day. So we had this uh, really a natural history experiment going on where people were accessing this and using this, and we wanted to um, track that use. So we, we got in touch with Johns Hopkins University and now have the largest registry in the world that's, that's tracking um, people who are using both cannabis and, and hemp. And we're looking at all kinds of different health outcomes, you know, hospital utilization and pharmaceutical usage and caregiver burden as a mom who used to get 11 hours of nursing services a day for her child, you know, how, and now he just needs very little help compared to where he was, you know, how do we track that in a scientific way where we can validate what it is that we were seeing. Otherwise, Zakai becoming seizure free for four years and beautiful Charlotte with a 99% reduction, they're just good stories. Right, um, and you lose those stories if you don't document right. them. So thankfully in, you in had a very the foresight. Validated way. Yeah. That yeah. You had and the foresight was... to say that this is important that we actually document all of this and collect this material and you have the biggest collection of this data and um, so all of these services that you're offering people through Realm of Caring, you talk to patients, you talk to doctors, you publish papers, and you're doing all of this for free, correct? Yeah, we rely on the support of um, businesses who believe corporate sponsorship, who believe in what we're doing. Um, and we also have a very broad community that's been very financially supportive. So we do fundraising events and, um, yeah, we have people who contribute every single month as a part of our friends and family program. So people have just been really, really incredibly supportive. And everyone can um, access more information about Realm of Caring at realmofcaring.org. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a phone number there that you can call to set up uh, an appointment to talk to somebody and um, get any kind of really, truly clinical information there um, that it's hard to get even from your own physician who may not even be educated in this. So we're very yeah. grateful for the presence of Realm of Caring. Thanks, and we're happy to talk with physicians. They're our third highest referral source in the call center, um, last I had checked, but also we have about 1,500 
that are registered with us that we're continually providing education to. So you can send your doctors to our website as well. And um, of course, there's a, a great uh, um, library of research there that's all alphabetized and you can search by, you know, whether it's in vitro, in vivo, you know, uh, clinical trials, uh, conditions, symptoms, et cetera. So, uh, Such a good resource. And we're really spot. excited and congratulations that you're going to have a paper published soon. That is not a small feat. That's a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, and I know we you just had got a big through hand the peer review. Yeah, we just got through peer review. So it'll be published, I, I hear this morning in the next couple of weeks. So Realm of Caring will definitely be um, talking about that, but it's in Cannabis and Cannabinoid uh, Research is the name of the journal, which is kind of the premier uh, peer-reviewed journal dedicated to cannabis research. And uh, our, our most established research societies, the, the oldest, I, um, ICRS and, and um, IACM, they're both, that's their mother journal. So we're really proud of that. And and Johns Hopkins in that relationship, and Ryan Bondre, um, and Marcel Von Miller, and several other researchers who, who have helped us do that, and do that right. Congratulations. I want to I wanna say something on that. So this is like, you know, four years in the making. I have to say, Heather, um, Heather was approaching um, the scientists, the researchers, and I really have to praise Marcel and Ryan you know, Johns Hopkins, um, because back then we were, we were still in a voodoo category, but they were willing to believe what our eyes were seeing and jump in, um, to say, okay, let's, let's really analyze this and let's get some good data. Heather and those researchers worked the last four years, um, validate everything we've been seeing from an anecdotal eyewitness basis. And I couldn't be more thankful and the industry shouldn't, I should be so thankful for these folks for spending those years to collect the data. Um, and I'm so excited to see it published. I got to see just a little bit of overview the other day. Um, and I have to tell you, I was in a Zoom meeting and seeing this data come through from a Johns Hopkins researcher, I had to stop my video multiple times because I was crying because my whole last more than decade of my life where I've been told, oh, that's anecdotal, um, anecdotal, or that what we were seeing was even bullshit by some people, you know, we were being told this. And I got to watch this whole last decade and a half of really hard work and all of our ups and downs, regulatory, legal, you know, it, it, this was a hard road. But I got to see all of it come together and validate what we've all been doing and seeing. And it's, it's so special to me, and I'm so excited to see those. Heather, you and the researchers, Ryan, Marcel, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to mention, too, that version 2.0 of the registry is launched. And so anyone with any condition can participate in that. And we want both cannabis users, hemp users, and non-users. So it's a really significant data set because we have a control group which usually doesn't happen. And it's happening retrospectively um, or prospectively rather, so into the future. So normally what happens is people just look, they'll take a survey, how's your last year been? And so there's this huge recall bias. And so we wanted to eliminate that. And so I really encourage ev everyone to uh, participate in that because we want to continue to collect this data. Um, that way we can in 10 years say, this is what folks who've used this, like Zakai has been using this for eight years. So as, as time goes on, you know, that will be extremely valuable for us. And by the way, that's how we educate from the call center. So we're not, you know, well, here, let me think of a, you know, we're actually using data to answer those questions. Oh, we have 40 people in the registry. Let's take a look at, you know, what, what they're using and how it's working and how much they're taking and contraindications. This is a, this isn't about just all the silver lining. This is about, you know, everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything. There's very little ugly, by the way, but it's good, <laughs> um, you know, we that need to know it. Yeah. we do need to know it. We absolutely need to know it. So, and thanks to everyone who participated. So thank you, Joel, for, for the thanks. But it, I mean, it would have been nothing if we didn't have families take the time to enter their data very consistently. So thanks to everyone for that. And here's, here's the paper. Oh, 
excited. I was uh, reviewing that this morning, so it should be out in a couple couple of weeks. And we open sourced it so everyone can get it. I, uh, for a while, was a uh, medical journal manager of all those articles, and I know the pain and energy that goes into getting to this point and yeah. I just like we really need to throw you a huge party honestly <laughs> you guys are all amazing and huge groundbreaking pioneers and we are all so grateful for you and I just wanted to share a little message from all of Charlotte's web we wanted to say thank you all for your efforts Heather and Jesse and Joel and all the other brothers because we wouldn't all be here without you and this industry wouldn't be here without you and we appreciate you so much and appreciate hearing your story and the history and it's just so meaningful and we're very um, fortunate to be able to carry out your mission of continuing to help people as being really the base basis of our company um, and we promise to keep going in the right direction with that so and Jen I hope this is like um, uh, the first the first episode because I didn't near get to talk as much as I want to about Charlotte and Paige. Um, and I, I just want to let everybody know that uh, under the circumstances, their family is uh, doing really well. I've picked out my commemorative tattoo and Paige just got hers um, this last week and, and um, Max and Chase are doing well and Matt and um, Greg, John are doing well. So, uh, you know, uh, just continue to keep them in your thoughts and um, and prayers and send them light and love and hopefully we'll have more opportunity to to either have Paige on and visit about the beginning because that will be hysterical and really great. I um, just wanted to make sure that I uh, mentioned um, little Charlotte by name and the family and that you know just everyone keep continue to think about them. Yes, she's always in our thoughts and we miss her terribly. And we are going to take you up on your offer to talk again because uh, I know I feel like I could talk to each of you for six hours and never get to the bottom of it. Um, if you guys don't mind, we'll take a couple questions before I let you go. Sure, great. All right, um, first of all, how do we first see the results of the John Hopkins research and how do we, you said about getting involved, what are the, what are the ways that people can get involved? Is that on Roma Caring or? So we'll be sure um, when this, this actually gets published, which will, should be in the next couple of weeks. So if you watch Realm of Caring's socials, so that's just at Realm of Caring on all of the different, all the every social uh, networks, uh, we'll make sure that you're aware of when this comes out and you can, you know, print it out and, um, and read it, review it and give it to your doctors and, and all of that. And the same, same way to get involved. There's a research tab on realmofcaring.org. Um, and also you can give us a call, which is 719-347-5400. And there's an 800 number, 888-210-3772. So you can call or hit our website, email us, and the care team will help you with how to get involved in, in the research, but it's also just right underneath the research tab. You just register and it's super easy. Thank you, Heather, Jesse, Joel. Um, you guys are amazing and we look forward to talking to you again. Our pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye time. everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>